Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy, where we explore the scriptural, theological, and in this case, again, historical case for plural marriage. I am excited to introduce you to my old college buddy, Jeremy Hoop, who I learned is one of the, in my opinion, top experts on the discussion of Joseph's polygamy. He really has gotten so deep down in the weeds and looked at every single piece of evidence. So I'm excited to introduce you to him today. We ended up speaking actually for three hours. So I've cut this down quite a bit. If it's a little bit choppy, I apologize. And also I'm still working on perfecting my um, interview style. I'm sure it will always be a work in progress, but I think there's so much value to this discussion. I wanted to tell you if there are a lot of names and things thrown around that you're not familiar with, don't worry about it. Again, we'll, I, I'm hoping that Jeremy, Jeremy and I will be able to have an ongoing discussion that he can come on periodically to cover more issues. So in the, on that note, for those who still believe that Joseph was a polygamist because the evidence is just so strong, I would love it if you would put in the comments some of the most convincing or compelling bits and pieces of evidence that you find, because um, I we really want to get in and make sure we have covered every single topic, every single piece of evidence so that we can all be seeking truth and not just seeking to defend our side. So if you would go ahead and put the evidence in the the comments, then I can um, ask Jeremy to come on and readdress it in a future episode. So please go ahead and do that so we can keep this discussion, discussion vibrant and useful and enlightening to all of us. So thank you so much for joining us as we take this deep dive into the murky waters of Joseph's polygamy. Okay, welcome to 132 Problems. I am actually really excited for this episode. I say this all the time, but it's not very fun that I get to have an old friend on my podcast. <laughs> so this is this is Jeremy Hoop. And fun fact, we were at BYU together in the music dance theater major. And you have to tell me, Jeremy, did you graduate in music dance theater or in acting? Did you switch uh, over to acting? On the acting track, yeah. So you went on, though, and had a career. It's been really fun to, to watch. So my son, on his mission, watched the Testaments over oh. and over. He said he watched it at least once a week because they were allowed to watch it, and he loved it. So he came home quoting my good friend Jeremy, who was the star of Testaments. And then, and then I know he saw you in Charlie, and I'm trying to remember. Yeah. You've, you've, anyway, done a bunch of Mormon films and then a lot of other TV work. And then I know that you've also taught a lot of acting mm -hmm. um, classes and seminars and then worked in other fields, I think investments and finance and yep. sales and marketing. So have I gotten that about right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> I, I've had a full-time, part-time career as an actor in Utah. It's, it's, uh, and a musician, doing... I should say. You're also a composer yep. and a singer and a musician. Yep, you've yeah. done some great stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I was a, as ambitious as they, as they make them as a younger person and and then I had a family and and uh, God showed me other things that were yeah. important. And and I should and, believe I should have let that out. I believe six children and five. Seven. Is it six? Ch oh, seven children and yes. six that are still with you. I, I read an yes. old bio. I was trying to remember. And I know yeah. Jeremiah <laughs> caught up recently and kind of were able to share our experiences of um, shouldn't bring that up, but some hard experiences that we've both um, yeah. that we've both had. So my heart goes yeah. out to you. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Don't so, make me cry. Anyway, <laughs> I know I shouldn't have started there. Shouldn't okay. have gone there first. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyway, and then I guess it was just this year when I saw you on the debate on hemlock knots mm -hmm. that I was like, what, Jeremy? You're you're in this debate? And you, you definitely were like, um, you were in the Joseph polygamy debate. I actually mm -hmm. didn't want to be in the Joseph polygamy <laughs> debate. Like I've, I've gotten here kicking yeah. and screaming. I just wanted to focus on, <laughs> on God and polygamy, not Joseph and polygamy. And I have to say, it's been an intense week. I Well, I released, when we're recording that, I released, um, when we're recording this, that was my most recent episode, the one about Joseph's I, polygamy. And boy, I watched it's it. Been... I watched okay. it. Yeah, it was very, very good. <laughs> and, Thank you. Thank you. But it's boy, it's it's brought out the haters big time. And I feel mm -hmm. bad to step into this into yeah. this arena. It's tough. It's hard. Welcome to the club. Yeah. I know. Well, I've been I've been in my own little club. It's interesting because I think that people that like I think the people that want to say, yeah, polygamy was never of God. 
um, who have left the church yeah. were on board with what I was doing. But now sure. that I'm saying polygamy also wasn't of Joseph, you know, people are really invested in this image of Joseph they had that really was instrumental in destroying their faith in yeah. the church and the gospel. And I, I find that interesting and unfortunate. And so I guess that's why I'm like, oh, maybe the Joseph debate does matter because, yeah, you know, it all gets lumped together. It, and, mm -hmm. and there's some value to saying, nope, it maybe doesn't deserve to all get lumped together. So I'm, I'm in, the, in this discussion now. But yeah. Anyway, well, you got here it, first. It's been it's been fascinating to watch your your transition, if you will, or this process of un, um, discovery, how it's unfolded for you. Uh, first of all, I, I think what you're doing, um, it's one of the best things I've ever seen on the subject because um, you've broken down the scriptural case uh, unlike anyone else I've ever seen. You've helped me understand there's a lot of things that, that I've worked through myself, but you have given me insights that that have further solidified my conviction um, uh, where I am today on the subject. And, um, and so I'm really grateful for what you've done because uh, it's, I think it's so valuable to have um, an articulate, um, strong woman talking about this from the from the scriptural perspective that has been needed um uh, carolyn pearson with her um uh, with her book that you that you talked about i think it's the, the ghost of eternal polygamy the ghost of eternal polygamy yeah mm -hmm. um the premise in that book is so important i mean we could talk about i can talk about from my perspective uh, and give you firsthand experience or, or my firsthand experience of of how that affected me and in, in in my first marriage um if you want to, I don't know if you want to. But, yeah, because uh, we hear, I think, more often from women, and it's and it's good to hear from men as well. We do hear from men, which I appreciate, but I'd love to yeah. hear your experience. Okay, I'll I'll be really candid with you. Um, I've who have I told this to? Not very many people. Um, so I I used to believe all of the standard narratives. I've been studying church history and and the doctrines of the, the restoration since my mission in 1990 um, through 93. I, I, I fell in love with um, I, I, I used to listen to the Truman Madsen tapes. I don't know if anybody knows what those are. And, and I he would tell these fantastic stories about Joseph Smith. And and I read all of the all of the standard narratives you're supposed to read on your mission back then. Marvelous work mm -hmm. and a wonder in Jesus the Christ. And it's and, and my mission was as much study as it was and study and reflection and contemplation as it was preaching the gospel for me. And um, it was a, an incredible experience. I, I was in Uruguay for a couple of years and. Um, and I, I walked away from that having a, a deep conviction of the mission of Joseph Smith, um, the importance of the Book of Mormon, and the um, and the character of Joseph Smith more than anything else, um, and as a human, I, I fell in love with him as a human being, um, and that's based that was based on some pretty limited understanding. I can say now, um, fast forward to fifty one, geez, um, I I had. I have almost a reverence for him. I want to be careful with the word reverence because I don't, I don't um, worship him in any way. But as far as human beings go, there's only a few: George Washington, Joseph Smith, and then then we've got mythical characters without much historical context, you know, from Christ's time or whatever. So, um, but for someone um, where we have so much available information. I find him to be an extraordinary human being. And I find the criticisms of him really unfortunate um, and um, so speculative and so relying on, on, frankly, slanderous testimony. What I find to be slanderous testimony. I understand why people believe it, you know, because there's a lot. There's a lot that people said. There's a lot of things that people said while he was alive. And there's a lot of things that people said while he was after he was murdered after he's dead um and you know if if the angel was telling the telling him the truth um uh, the angel nephi by the way um not moroni nephi 
um, that his yeah the, the angel he saw in his bedroom was not Moroni it was Nephi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fun, a whole fun, other <laughs> sidetrack. Maybe you'll have to fill fun, me in on that after. It's a okay. fun fact. He, he told the story several times, and he always said it was Nephi. It got turned into Moroni somewhere, and I'll have to track the story down. But anyway, the angel um, told him his name would be spoken, um, you know, for good and evil, and and it has been. And so and we've seen that that keeps having more and more and yeah, more depth. It's just as more and more correct, more and more depth as people become more and more po polarized uh, as far as Joseph Smith's concerned. Through my mission coming home, um, I gained I gained a deep conviction um, for two things in particular that Joseph taught. Number one was this idea that that we could have every revelation that he had, that we could meet our Lord in the flesh. We could have this this experience called calling an election and the more sure word of prophecy and the second comforter. And I found that so astonishing. Um, it's a really unique doctrine that, okay. that, that the being who created this planet, created this universe would come into your living room and visit you from time to time and, and instruct you on the things of eternity and actually tell you really where you come from and what the age of the earth really is and how this whole thing really works. He, he, he actually taught that. And, and I found that so now, whether you believe that or not, that he, but he taught it. And for me, I thought huh that's um that's something i would like to i'd like to pursue and he taught this idea of zion this idea of a of a society a flat society of equals who all know god and who all love one another and care for one another and have one heart and one mind and they and they have all things in common and and um those two concepts for me resonated so powerfully well um, I'm kind of t taking a tangent and then getting going to get back to the the how polygamy affected me in my marriage and and just as a young man. But what I noticed was in in um, as I grew up um, uh, through my adult years in the church, I noticed that not many people really cared about that stuff in the church. Okay, that was my experience. Um, and I would talk about these. things. I felt the same way as I discovered these things and they rocked my world because I think that's the like for me, that's what was what, what the Book of Mormon opened up to teach me was that not only is this possible, it's the very purpose of the gospel, it's the entire purpose. the way that we that we <laughs> like we, we always say, I'll live with God again someday. What it means is, no, you overcome death, you overcome spiritual death by coming back into the presence of God. Yes. You overcome physical death well, by eventually being translated, which is the city of Enoch. That's what Joseph yes. was teaching. And that's the actual purpose. So, yeah, I'm on board yes. with you. And I remember discovering this going why didn't anyone to uh, surely this can't be true because someone would have told me and how can i think i know things that i have like it, it's very yes. lonely it's a yeah. very lonely yes. thing to discover yes i was i i constantly felt myself a stranger in a sojourner teaching gospel doctrine class or high priest group or or commenting trying to or, keep it safe <laughs> You yeah, know, like and, say enough that yeah that you and, can and, be true to yourself, but keep it safe. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, anyway, I'll, sorry, I would just quote Joseph, and and I would get strange looks, and anyway, um, uh, so and I'm like you, I I for me, the Book of Mormon um is 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 a precious gift because of because it teaches that uh, it's what the Lord told the brother brother of Jared, you're redeemed because you've seen me. Because you're in my presence. Wait, what? Redemption's not just about dying and going to heaven. Redemption's about bring, being brought back into the presence of God. And this this parable of walking along this path with a rod of iron, and you endure to the end of life or the end of the path. No, it's the end, the of, the end path, of the path, right? Is, into the goal. This you tree, endure into the this tree goal. Has this fruit? That's the love of God, and 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 it's a representation of the being of Christ. Anyway, so so. I fell in love with the restoration and with Joseph Smith and and um, the things he taught. So for whatever reason, you know, um, I could read all kinds of salacious stuff about him. And I've read all the salacious stuff about him. You know, the CES letter was just like reading some kind of strange um, word rearrangement <laughs> of, of some word puzzle. Saying, so look, look how awful this is. I'm like, wait, what? Okay, let's pull this apart. And and those arguments, they don't hold water for me. And I, and, and I understand why they do for people, but they 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 
they sound like um, straining at gnats. And um, okay. instead of oh, okay. instead of seeing what because to 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 focus on those things, you have to ignore a mountain, a mountain of accomplishment just within the Book of Mormon itself. If you want to just talk about chiasms and Hebraisms in the Book of Mormon. Hey, don't give me it is interesting it's so interesting because on the one hand it's so easy to have this testimony that's really based in ignorance Do you, you know what i mean yeah. like you just were always taught and and you have a couple of experiences and so it's all true and you're and you know but then at the same time it seems to kind of flip to all of a sudden you learned all of these things so now you have this anti-testimony this testimony against joseph smith yeah. but that also i mean i know a lot of people have done a lot <laughs> of study on both sides but it yes. seems to be the same um, level of hostility and cert certitude yeah. that's not open to let's actually discuss. You know, people are just invested, just as invested in really hating Joseph Smith as yeah. they were in loving him. And, so and it's by, really an interesting thing. By to the see. way, I should I should say um, I'm really sensitive to how people who are in the church or people who have left the church, their response to all of these things. And I really empathize with people people in both places i really do um we were mentioning something we have in common i i lost a child in 2013 and and that that put me into a place where i had a a, a different perspective um i was forced into a different perspective and that caused me to question everything and i spent a season throwing everything out and starting over um, because nothing made sense to me. And I, and I fully appreciate, well, I don't know if I fully appreciate, I can really appreciate the, where, how people become agnostic. Um, I was there. I, I fully appreciate how people can become completely throughout God altogether and, and, and not be able to make sense of their belief system, their former belief system. So, so as I'm talking about these things, if there are people listening that, you know, they, they, they no longer believe in, in the restoration. I, I don't mean to disparage that because I, I get that. And I do too. Yeah. I'm very sympathetic to it. And some people that I am very close to, I watched them go through it and I, you know, I, I didn't have a, anyway, I, I have a lot of understanding and empathy for it. So yeah, I'm on the same page as you. So I, I want to make that that there were still an opening to consider to, to continue to consider. I'm well, always like, let's keep investigating. Don't settle there yeah. either. So, but, so but and I that's do been understand. my experience. That was my experience was to was to dive deeper into it. And a lot of people do, but they, but for whatever reason, it do, still doesn't work. And it doesn't work almost entirely because of this subject, because of polygamy. It's almost entirely this, because this is where it starts. It starts with Joseph bedded a 14 year old. I'm, I'm done. Or Joseph sent me, guy on, guys on missions to marry their wives. I'm done. Or uh, Joseph was um, uh, hiding all this from Emma and, and, and he even tried to poison her. And, and I mean, she tried to poison him yeah. and, and this back and forth. And I'm He's... done. I can't, I can't be involved in this thing because I can't trust him anymore. And I get that. I understand that. And not only I can't trust him, he's a lustful, womanizing, yeah. predatory, uh, using his power, hypocritical, yeah. like all, all of that. It, it paints a dark picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I understand very well why people get to that place. What I have found to get to that place, by the way, you do have to ignore a lot. I and agree. you and you have to you have to take the word of people who hated him so much that they tried to or or were in league to try to kill him. You also have to take the word of people who have motives that have not been really well examined. And we can talk about some of that today. Um, in fact, OK, I, so so I want to clarify one thing right here. And then we still have to go back to you were talking about your first your yeah. first marriage. We're, yeah. we're, we're going to go everywhere. <laughs> but um, so I do want to clarify. I think that a lot of people are just appalled at the idea that anyone would think Joseph wasn't a polygamist because there's so much. So so I think not that only, the idea not only that Joseph, appalled, not only appalled, but they. But they the mockery, they 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 right. oh, they, they want to do brutal. to they want to do to you what the CIA's tactic is. Okay, the C here's the CIA's yeah. tactic. Anytime someone brings up something that hits home,
close to them, they call them a conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy theorist. Right. A hiss which, and a byword. Which, by the way, the CIA now, a lot of people, are they're on to you. We're on to you. And you finally admitted this year that Lee Harvey Oswald was actually working for you. We're going okay. into all kinds so. of conspiracies. Well, it's true. <laughs> so. I mean, like, I didn't go for the shots and for the, you know, right. and Neither and, and boy. Yeah. And and what they do is they deplatform you. I've had people now, um, well, I hate to say, but I have had people refuse to come on because like like they don't want to have to engage in this topic. Right. They'd rather just yeah. say you're ridiculous, you're right. not worth talking to. Right. Like someone just this just yesterday was incredible who who I had wanted to have on the podcast and had, I think, planned to, but, you know, so so it's going to be interesting to see where it goes from here because what they do, like, people think that, like, I, I'm invested in needing Joseph to be this. No, I came here really kicking and screaming. It took a lot so did to I. get me here. And, um, I, you know, I had, I had peace in different scenarios all along the way. And I did face the whole, do I throw out the Book of Mormon? Not based on this issue, but, you know, so I'm similar to you. And actually, it's cost me a lot to, yeah. to come to this place. So anyone that's, you know, you know, people can be really, like, like intentionally. We're, we're kind of now on other, we're on everyone's sacred cows, right? Mm -hmm. People that need to believe in polygamy and believe the standard narrative and have, you know, have the um, Brighamite tradition, I guess, our LDS tradition, mm -hmm. we're on their sacred cows. And now the people that hate Joseph Smith, we're on their sacred cows. So, so it's really interesting <laughs> to see the hate come in. And so the one thing I had wanted to clarify is, to believe that Joseph wasn't a polygamist means that we must believe that there was a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. That's it. We, there was a conspiracy. So we're not denying any of the claims that the, that the claims don't exist. We're saying we you need to look at the the um, credibility of those claims by judging the motives, the yeah. you know the the accuracy of their stories. Like so, that's what. So I just wanted to clarify that we're, we're of course not ignorant of the claims that are out there. No. We are looking at it, all of them in depth and to clarify and say, too is it credible on their side. They're conspiracy theorists as well because they believe there was a conspiracy during Joseph's lifetime to hide the stuff. And to it keep it secret. from the public. Yeah. And, and yet that, sorry, folks, is a theory. It's a theory because there are no provable facts to establish it other than what comes decades after the fact. And what and, and by inference during his, his lifetime, by inference only, not by established fact. At the end of the day, what 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 they come to is when you when you when you point out all of the all of the problems with their narrative at the end of the day they all get to one point and that one point is i just don't believe that many people would that lie many people would lie and so it's the, it's the conspiracy theory argument so there i'm gonna, too many people in on it i'm go i'm going to talk a little bit about that today just a little because that okay that becomes a go really interesting um exercise the anatomy of a lie and how it works, and evidences, uh, clear evidences of it, um, from the swath of things they call um, fact. And so we'll examine that. And you know, people can make up their minds. By the way, I would recommend anybody who's who's watching this. If you're really interested, if you find things that Michelle's done compelling, if you find things like Whitney Horney has Horning has um, written to be compelling. Um, if you listen to the talk that I gave, um, which is on my podcast, if you find that compelling, don't... I'll put the links below as well to your okay. debate and your talk. And yeah, don't trust us. Don't trust them. Do your own homework and read the sources yourself, but read all of them. On the one side, they curate their sources into a bundle, into a picture that sounds like it's incontrovertible. Factual. Until, they present it as factual. Right. Mm -hmm. And and they state it as such. Uh, Todd Compton has this habit, for example, and man, he's he is really hard to to dislike because he's such a he's such a likable such man. Such a great guy. Uh-huh. By the way, I don't mean to say that we should dislike him. I'm just saying he's so he's so nice. But he has this habit of stating things as though Joseph himself wrote it in his journal, as though Emma herself, as though there's a record at the time. We can talk more about that, but let's go back to how this affected. 
Yes. Uh, me personally. So, okay. So on my mission, um, <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing. So I, um, I, I was a very hardworking, faithful missionary. I, I, I was so focused and dedicated, um, like no other time before that and hardly any other time after that, um, to what I believed, um, God was wanting me to do. And I, I, I tried to really serve a faithful mission. I remember teaching a particular woman. Um, we had one discussion with her. This was in the capital city, Montevideo. And, and sh I remember feeling, um, a compelling spirit from her. And it, it really struck me. And I remember that I, I felt now this is going to maybe not be believable to people, but I, I, I remember feeling nothing sexual toward her, nothing. It purely, um, I don't know, brotherly, sisterly, love, however, love. I, I just felt, I mm -hmm. felt something very pure. Um, and I remember, I remember praying. This is really embarrassing, but I remember praying if she is not married in the hereafter, I would be honored for her to be my wife. In addition to whomever else I had. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just weird. Hey, I, I'll, I remember, I'll I'm going to tell you a couple, you. I'm going to tell you a couple more. Okay. Okay. I remember um, a friend of mine I grew up with who was like my sister. I never had a romantic thought about her at all. Um, and I remember praying the same thing, getting on my knees and praying for that, that if she was not married in the hereafter, that, you know, if she could be with me, I would, I would welcome that. And it's weird. And I remember during my marriage, um, we had some, some real struggles. Um, I married a, an incredible woman. Um, we brought seven souls into the world. We lost a child together. We went through a lot. There were some times when we would discuss, when she would tell me her struggles with polygamy. And by the way, I never promoted it to her. I didn't but I believe that it was a thing in the hereafter, possibly. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know if you did or didn't, you know. But she would tell me things that I was, that I should have been so much more um, validating of and empathetic to. Um, she would say, I just don't want to be somebody's property. I, and, and, and in my mind, I couldn't reconcile how a loving God would, would make that the thing. And I, and I believe that it was probably the case for some people, maybe for all, I don't know, because I knew some of the statements that Brigham Young had made and that they would teach about it being the law of the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, and you couldn't get there without it. So I didn't know how to reconcile all these things. And so I, I made, I, I, by my lack of empathy and by my even acknowledging that I believed it to be a possibility, it was very hurtful to her. And I'm very so can sorry. Can I ask, were you, were you like, um, were you, were you, were you kind of the pat on the head? Like, Oh God won't do that. You don't need to worry about it. Or were you like, well, it's God's commandment. So, or like, was, how, how did you, I was, I don't know if I was either of those. I do think I said, I probably said, I just think I tried to say it kindly but i think Lovingly, i think i probably right. said i think we just need to have faith that it'll all work out yeah. somehow and we're told that a lot and and i didn't want to interrupt you because you were saying I, like i love that you're being so um so kind and and thoughtful you know, you know i i this is really hard to uh, to admit all of this you it know really, it Not really hurt her it hurt her deeply <sighs> and and i and i still to this day um i i feel terribly for that. I regret that. Um, I don't know if she'll ever watch this, but uh, I've told her this, you know, but um, anyway, if you're watching this, um, yeah. I'm telling the world this. So um, also, uh, well, um, so 
I've heard women say that it it can make them so afraid of the next life it 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 can inhibit them from giving their whole heart to their husband. It does the same right. thing to men. And so I remember in troubling times in our marriage when things were not going well. I would I I never thought of it sexually. I never thought of polygamy mm -hmm. sexually in the in the eternal eternities, believe it or not. I what I thought was I maybe I'll have a wife that loves me. That understands me, that loves me, that okay. Oh. And that the that way, was such yeah. a painful thought. And and it's such a warped thought. It's such a horrible thing to to find yourself thinking. Instead of turning what I should have done, turn within toward. and toward her and 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 figure it out how to be humble and and to and to heal the breach. And, you know, I, I learned a lot of things way too late, you know, um, anyway. So so oh, that's so just a little insight. Like it, you feel like it directly had an effect on 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 your first marriage at not times, yes. surviving at, at okay at, well i don't know and, i don't know how much it played in ultimately the it was 7 years between the death of our son and our divorce and and 80% of marriages don't survive the loss right. of a child it's very very difficult and i and, will say my husband and i have had to dig deep yeah, yeah. it's hard it's hard to go through mm -hmm. yeah it's it and and by the way um, my heart goes out to you tremendously so <laughs> so i shouldn't well, okay moving on yes okay <laughs> so that so i wanted to mention that because um because this this narrative has been a part of my being since i can remember and so when so I'm, like you're saying when people say oh it's just so easy for you to believe these right. things now i i have i have dug into this with the exception of the book of mormon and the scriptures and the teachings of Joseph Smith. I've dug into this more than I've, I've, I've looked at anything, and um, not as maybe as much as some, but more than most. And mm -hmm. I can say now um, that I I have a greater respect for Joseph Smith than I've ever had. Okay. And I have to respond to your story as soon as you go ahead and finish. And no, then I have to You go ahead. I'll, I'm going to take Okay, So this is one of my really like awful. OK, vulnerability overload again. Ah, um, so this has been because just like you talk about how polygamy like who was I? I think it was Whitney Horning and I were talking about how it actually weakens the commitment of marriage. And I think. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of different aspects that I want to share, but women also can very easily think in the next life, I can, I can have a husband who will love me because I will have a prophet or I can have oh. a man who's right. A so righteous man. Same. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. A mm. man who like, like I've heard women express that my experience wasn't that because my husband and I are backward. Like mm. he was, I was the one that was like, no, polygamy is great. Of course, just trust God. It'll, you know, and, and he was the one that was like, honey, <laughs> I, you know, like I'm not comfortable with this. So th there's something wrong with me apparently. Cause I, I was like, no, it's good. I was raised to believe that God would, wouldn't have us do something that wouldn't make mm. us happy. But this is the weird thing I will acknowledge, just as you were describing, aha, uh -huh, this, okay, this is where the vulnerability overload comes in. But just as you were describing the connections you would sometimes feel to women, I have had that same thing with men. Never, never anything, you know, but like a single man who is a good man, who, you know, who I was like, what can I do for him? What, do, you know, so it's actually been good for me. And, and then, of course, going, okay, God, like, I can't marry him. I already have a husband. Like, what could, you know, it, it's a mess for, for, it's been a mess for me. But what I have valued from it is that when men tell me I have these feelings, I know, I'm like, yeah, ditto. They're not confirma the confirmations you think they are because yes. I relate to them direct exactly like sometimes really profoundly yes this like connection gratitude love nothing spiritual i, I mean not, nothing like purely spiritual not at yes. all sexual you know yes and feeling like there's some connection there and i would love to 
have that guy have a family and a wife. And and so as weird as that may sound to people, it shouldn't be any weirder for a woman than it is for a man. No. It's not a testimony of the truthfulness no. of polygamy. Men interpret it that way. Women just go, what's wrong with me? So I have I've had the privilege and the weird opportunity to observe all kinds of people who enga- who have engaged in today this kind of stuff under the guise of some kind of spiritual connection or 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 having been sealed in a previous life or uh, they, or being I've sealed by called, the Lord now. Been, uh-huh. Yes, I've heard it called dyadic companions, um, uh, bonded wives, um, uh, uh, star-crossed bonded lovers. Bonded wives wanna... doesn't sound good. <laughs> Sorry. That's what some of them called it. And there were, there were okay. I've met women doing it and men doing it. And, and what I've noticed, see, <laughs> there's this thing where people believe there's a righteous way to do it. And then right. there's the uh, all the rest which is just right. wicked and awful. But the problem is it never works. No. It, I was just reading through the journal, one of my great, well, great, there's great... no righteous way to commit adultery. There's no righteous way to commit murder. You can't say, oh, I'm following the example of Nephi so I can commit murder. That's how we get the Lafferty's and the LeBarons. And it always starts with polygamy. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, go ahead. Keep going. No, I was just reading through one, one of the uh, memoirs of one of my great, great, great grandmas today. And she talked about when her husband took a second wife and all she said was it went against my natural feelings, but I consented to enter into the order to fulfill the will of heaven, you know, and I could, I could hear her heartbreaking Mm -hmm. and these, uh, you know, and I, it's hard to have anything but compassion for these people who believed this was, this was the stairway to heaven. This was, this was how you became a God. And yeah, they it's were important to put the it. blame, the blame where it belongs, which is on the father of lies. Cause this was a yeah. lie. That's the pain comes from believing a lie. Because so it's not true. What, what pulled me out of that mindset and, and it, it began the transition to studying this issue and helping me understand why I believe now that this is Joseph equated this with polygamy and spiritual wifery and plurality of wives. He never di- differentiated. He equated those no. with abominations and whoredoms and adultery always. No matter what. And people who want to split hairs and say, no, he was talking about this, not this. They have never produced a single no. quote. And even our even our Utah leaders talked about polygamy. Polygamy is all through the Journal of Discourses. Yeah. So they use polygamy far more often than they use celestial marriage. It's, it's correct. And, and they also said, it, as Emily Partridge said, in those days in Nauvoo, we called it spiritual wifery. Okay. Okay. So, so Joseph equated all those together i i know brian hales wants to to separate you know polygamy and and plurality of wise celestial marriage from john bennett's but joseph put them all in one lump and you can't you simply can't find anything from joseph you have to rely on what other people said joseph said the problem is when you rely on what other people said joseph said you have to see if you can trust what they're saying um and so what took me out of um believing that was first I, I had a, a a dear gospel teacher who who he said something about marriage that really changed my perspective. He said what a tr- what catches the attention of the heavens the very most is when a man and a woman in marriage are so united that their marriage mirrors the heavenly marriage. That's what draws the attention of the angels to begin their work. And I thought, wow, that's, that's interesting. That's cool. Okay. And the, and the idea was to strive for a marriage that mirrors the heavenly marriage, whatever that means. So you have to discover what, how, mm -hmm. how, how how do the gods, how do, how does a heavenly couple, how are, how are they married together? And I think we have clues, no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by by virtue of any relationship, let alone priesthood or marriage, especially man over a woman or even woman over a man, 
only by persuasion, by gentleness, by meekness, by kindness, by love unfeigned, by pure knowledge, without hypocrisy, without guile. These these godly virtues, where where there's free um, interchange between two people who respect each other as equals, who collaborate, who 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 don't demand and control and coerce and manipulate, but invite and entreat and. And, and, and whose are hearts patient. aren't turning outward. They're turning of toward a, each other. They're turning toward they, each other. They they leave their father and, and toward their mother, God. Yep. and they become one flesh, you know, and and they love each other, body and soul. And yeah, it sounds like uh, you know your your iconic love story, but that's the point. And I mm-hmm. and I I was so jaded as a young man. My parents got divorced, and I was I was not taught very well. I had a I had a very cold grandma. Uh, they slept. My grandma and grandpa slept in separate beds, and I, I'm, she was a wonderful woman. Uh, stories galore and uh, great vacations at her house. But she was kind of a cold fish, and and my mom was a bit cantankerous and beautiful woman, uh, incredible singer, but as, but not so. She's a little prickly, you know. And but she had not been she had not been cared for by by the men in her life either. And and my father didn't know how to be a a husband and so i i didn't have a good example and i didn't know what it meant to have a a good marriage and so when i'm hearing the description of what a godly marriage is and i'm examining in in myself what i lacked then i finally realized wow First of all, I want to believe that it's possible to have that kind of marriage because I think that's where it has to start. I think a lot of people just don't even believe in that kind of love. They really don't. And 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 the scriptures inspire us to that kind of love, you know. Well, this teacher put it in such a way that I finally wanted that. So I started to work on myself and make changes and and, and try to figure out how to be that kind of husband. Um, honey, if you're watching, I hope I'm figuring that out. So, um, in that process, uh, I, I came across an article and read a paper and this paper was called Joseph Smith's monogamy. Okay. It was by, um, an anonymous writer. I know him. He's a great guy. And it really sparked my interest. And then, I listened to a couple other talks and then started reading a few books by the prices. And I read a book called the exoneration of Emma Joseph and Hiram. And then I, um, and then I read Whitney Horning's book. And in the meantime, I started to go and look up. I didn't care so much what the opinions of the authors were. I wanted to know what the sources said. So every time I would dig up the sources and go look at it myself. You spend more time in the index and the footnotes than you do in the actual text. One hundred percent. I have I have a ridiculous number of bookmarks <laughs> in my browser, and I have so many documents I've downloaded. It's mm-hmm. it's kind of disgusting. I have to organize it all. So, in that process, um, as I was, I would talk to people about what I was learning, and and um, I got asked to to deliver a talk on the subject at a. It was a restoration conference where a bunch of different branches of the restoration from Strangites to Cutlerites to um, Reorganites were all invited to come. It was fascinating because I heard these perspectives of these people who love the Book of Mormon and they're not LDS. Wow. Um, and and I talked on polygamy, which a lot of them, they they don't believe Joseph was a polygamist either. Well, because only the if we're going to use the term, only the Brighamites do and branches of right well, so, the, stra- anyway, the strangites kind of there there are some other Later offshoots on. that did weird stuff i mean i even heard today that some authors have opined that that spiritual wifery was part of sydney rigdon's philosophy i mean i, I gotta figure, figure that one out but that that he he had it back in his campbellite days and it just so happens john c bennett was a campbellite preacher so i don't know maybe john c bennett learned it from sydney i don't i don't know but it, it's it's complicated excuse me so i i began to study this stuff and and i gained enough of a conviction of it to write um what i considered to be an opening statement in defense of joseph smith this is this subject is way too big um in order to to 
to convince anybody in soundbite. So I, I know that people listening to this, there's people throwing stuff at their computer right now saying that you guys are so dumb. How can you possibly even? They probably everybody did that all knows. a couple of weeks ago and now they won't listen anymore. But yeah, right. that's what and it is. It's everybody knows. The science is settled. Yeah. And so, so there's so, no discussion to be had. So, so I want you to walk us through. Oh, okay. go ahead. So okay. from that perspective, um, I did a lot of work on that on that paper and that talk. Um, I started a podcast and I got divorced. And so I put it aside. I've recently got back into it and I have, um, I have done a, a, a deep and nearly exhaustive dive on the subject to where I can't think of at the present an argument that has been put forward by the best I've heard that I haven't been able to thoroughly investigate. Um, I'll leave it to others to judge whether, you know, the things I put forward are, are compelling or not. I would say look at the sources. I, I want to make a comparison because when I was studying polygamy, mm -hmm. I would get these arguments and I'd go, okay, this is the claim. And then I'd investigate it and it would just be like, what? Like it was so weak. Yeah. And I think that's what's been the most surprising about the, yeah. the sincere study into Joseph is that it feels like exactly the same thing is happening. Where I can't yeah. say I have a comprehensive knowledge of all of the sources, but everyone I have looked into thus far, I'm like, wait, that's that's not – it's kind of the same thing. There, There is – I mean, really, as you and I have talked about before – like once there was no children, it should be like game over, discussion yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. And yet we we have to keep going and going yeah. and going. You yeah. know. So it's like it's like how many how many times do we have to disprove this in how many ways? But that should right there be kind of like okay, red flag. And and especially when we claim the the false claim of the reason for polygamy, the main one is to raise up seed. Yeah. And so Joseph completely failed. Uh, right? right. I mean, it should all, it should be like okay, done. But right here, we keep going. So it, it anyway, depends on continue. what the meaning of the word seed is, and so <laughs> and 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 how you view the context of the entire chapters. And you've talked about that uh, in in such a comprehensive way. Yeah, it, what, I'm talking what, about from the pro polygamist side. Yeah, right. How many pretzels right. they are going to tie? How many times? And how many different knots? And there's there anyway, are there how are many magic tricks do they have up their there sleeves? There are a thousand whatabouts. What about what about what about? For now, I cut the part of our discussion where we talk about the revelation Hiram read in front of the High Council, which polygamists claim was Section One Thirty Two. We'll get into those complicated sources in future episodes. We go on to talk about where some of the ideas found in One Thirty Two might have come from. Whatever Hiram read, okay, Brigham Young himself said, I was in England long before Joseph ever said a word, in 1830, 1940, I guess, and I was, by vision and by the Spirit, I received the principles of a plurality of wives, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, that he was taught in his own revelation in England. And we have, is that in the Journal of Discourses, or no, is that in, in a journal? That's in, that's, in, um, that's in one of the statements he makes, I believe. Oh, I got to find it. It's a, uh, okay, it's maybe a you very, can send it to me, and I'll put the link. It's so a that very well-known statement. Brigham acknowledges mm -hmm. that he I've learned it. it before Joseph ever said a word. And then he says, I talked to Joseph later, and he was basically impressed that I knew the principles, basically. Yeah, okay. doesn't he say he hadn't even thought of it until I talked to him about it, or something like that? He said there had not lines. been a word of it in the church, Okay. Okay. And and uh, even though that story is all fuzzy, because apparently Joseph's telling uh, um, uh, what's her uh, Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner things that he was, you know, that when she was twelve, that he was uh, he had been he had the inspiration that she would be his first wife, and and uh, we can't get the date straight. Is it eighteen thirty one or eighteen twenty nine? The whole story of how this revelation starts is a mess. But regardless, Brigham says I learned it in England before Joseph ever says a word. So, can we postulate, is it possible that Brigham Young had already worked out the doctrine that there's no sin you can commit once you enter this principle? There's no sin you can commit that can derail your exaltation, save shedding of innocent blood and the sin against the Holy Ghost, that your exaltation is secure, that you can marry virgins, that uh, you can have as many wives or, you know, 10 wives, the things that Austin Cowell's names, okay? 
because we know from Emily Partridge. Emily Partridge learns about plural marriage, plurality of wives, spiritual wifery, as she called it, before Joseph ever said a word to her. How okay? do you know that? She, she she tells about it in her memoirs. Okay. She, okay. she says, I gained a testimony of the principle of the things Joseph would have said to me had he explained them to me before. Okay. And how does she do okay. that? Because she learned from a Mrs. Durfee and in her temple lot testimony, she says it was whispered about in Nauvoo. It was whispered about. And we have testimony of people who Catherine Lewis says, I was in 1843. I was approached by an elder who taught me about this principle and said, if you ever tell anybody, I'll, I will, I will tell them you're lying. But he, but People were whispering this stuff all over, not just Nauvoo, but in Boston and in England. Okay, But Brigham had it in the 1839-40 period. And we know that Heber Kimball <laughs> writes in his own journal. This is his mission journal. I can show you the page. He writes in his mission journal that he's at alone with a, a sister, Ellen. He's not his wife. They're writing a letter. He and she are writing a letter to his wife, Valate. And at the end of who's the day, who's at home? And, who's okay. at home? Who's... That's right, in Nauvoo. Um, they're writing a letter to Valate. Wilford Woodruff is in the apartment. He goes out preaching. They had people come to see him. They're gone. They're all alone. Says she combed my hair, and then we washed our feet and went to bed. The point I'm making no, I, is I... that this stuff was going on before Joseph ever taught it. Uh, to the 12 okay this well that's what i thought the on... fact that they get some details right isn't necessarily that impressive because obviously things were being said and done and people were saying joseph says joseph approves and so they and, could have uh, definitely included some of the details that they let, let that later were included in 132 that, that is called... plausible although a wild conspiracy theory yes that word there that that word plausible tale was used by women who testified against John Bennett. They said they told us a plausible tale, that Joseph okay. is the one who's saying that we can do this. By okay. the way, that started Samson Avard, who was the who was the the guy who ran the Danites. His excuse for all the violence he was committing was that Joseph told me to do it. Okay, and Joseph denied it vehemently, and and Samson had no proof, and Joseph was not ever. Um, uh, held to account Evicted. for the things Avard was doing. This started. Okay. The, so that's we putting, have the Danites and the polygamy and all of these things that we have against Joseph, based just on claims so, of people that were doing it, saying Joseph told me. So this okay. is nothing new. This is nothing new. That Joseph's been dealing with people putting words in his mouth to do their wicked acts for a long time. Okay. Now, so this is he. This is um, Heber Kimball's. Can you see my screen? This is Heber Kimball's mm -hmm. journal from. January of 1840. Can you full screen it? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Yes. If not, that's um, okay. Then. If that worked. That didn't work. There okay. we go. Okay. That's okay. So. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yep. On the 21st, very, um, very unwell with a bad cold, uh, wrote one letter, Susanna, um, received one from home, <laughs> from Joseph Brotherton. He sent us the of uh, Stan, Sister Ellen came in the evening. She finished. Let's go to the next page. By the way, he's been hanging out with this Sister Ellen for many days. Okay. Why? I'm in any case, a mission president would be highly, highly concerned if this, this were would happening be a problem. Today. And by the way, he's doing all <laughs> kinds of weird stuff. Um, I got to change the pages. He's doing all kinds of weird and stuff with women. Um, he's hanging out with women alone. There, he's having several instances where women are cutting his hair and combing his hair, and uh, and I believe washing his feet, which is strange. I mean, I don't know. Is I don't know the social mores of those days, but is it normal for a married man to have women, um, you know, combing your hair and cutting your hair? I don't know. Uh, maybe that's maybe maybe it was female barbers in those days, but it says this. The letter, it's just a uh, pedicure. <laughs> something about the letter Sorry. to my wife. So Ellen is working on the letter to my wife. She stayed with me through the evening. Elder W, that's Elder Woodruff, went and preached after meeting the doctor and his wife. This is a Dr. Copeland. He's been hanging out with some Dr. Copeland, traipsing around London with a Dr. Copeland. I don't know what this is about, but he mentions him a lot. Uh, the doctor and his wife and others come in to see me. Sister Ellen 
combed my head. If you can see this, you can see what it says. Now look what they've done. Somebody it's scratched. Erased. Somebody tried to erase this. We washed our feet and went to bed. Okay. That was just found last year. And that what was year found, was this? This is in 1840. The and we claim that Joseph Smith's first wife was 1841. 1841, is that what it was Louisa to... Beeman. Okay. Louisa yeah, and they, Beeman. Yeah, and they and they keep they keep going backward. I people claim all kinds of wives they have no proof for, but because somebody said well, like, it, they'll they'll attach a wife, right? But that's okay, just so one, let me... that's one example of to, to show that there's some stuff going on in England. Brigham says okay. I learned it in England. Lorenzo Snow says I it was revealed to me in England. So my point is if if Brigham had this already in his head okay and and he and he and he he makes a big deal about it because hey god told me he told me before joseph told me if he's got this in his head is it possible that brigham young had already worked out the basics behind the revelation the things about there's no sin you can commit that uh marrying 10 virgins um and the things that austin cowles refer austin cowles doesn't go into great detail he just names four or five things that are in the substance of the revelation is it possible that brigham was telling people this is the word of god this is what either joseph has told us or this is what god has told us we can do and we know they're doing all kinds of interesting and strange and weird things um that because they're taking wives in 1842 maybe as early as 1841, um, Heber and Brigham and maybe a couple others. Um, and then they get back to Nau Nauvoo and John's doing his thing. John Bennett's doing his thing. So when Austin Cowell says, I was, I heard the revelation. If he's upset at Joseph for whatever reason, we know he's going on with the, the, the laws, Foster's Higby's um, and that he's going to become the first counselor in the church the new church that william law starts okay the competing church so cowles is upset is it possible that cowles purposefully knows that there's this other revelation being talked about and that he purposefully conflates the two if you can't acknowledge that that's possible given the fact that no revelation was ever produced at the time given the fact that joseph smith and Hiram vehemently denied it is it possible? And if you can't acknowledge that it's possible, then I don't know that you're a fair broker of information. So, so that's just one I example. Think, yep. And I works. think, so I'm seeing part of the challenge. The challenge is it is so specific and detailed yeah, and it's very. so much easier to believe this side or this side, right? It is. It and is. And so, because look at how much we had to just break down to get that Austin Cowles piece. And you do, unfortunately, piece. unfortunately you do. And that's, right. frankly, that's the work that I'm engaged in right now is trying to make this consumable for people so they don't have to do what I've done because it's exhausting. But if you can understand it in chunks, then you can understand the whole, I believe. And there are, well, there's so about... That's, there's about eight or nine main issues that you need to really absorb. And once you do, I think you can you can make a really intelligent choice. That doesn't mean I acknowledge doesn't mean everybody's going to necessarily agree with what I what I see. But however, I'll, I'll give you an example. So my my wife, Deborah, um, she gave me permission to, to talk about this. When I first met her, she thought I was nuts <laughs> on this issue. And she just she didn't tell me the full extent to which she thought I was nuts until later, but she did. She thought I was crazy. And at one point, uh, she listened to the talk I gave um, on my podcast, Still Mormon. And she um, she said, OK, that's interesting. The, the talk that I give is just an opening statement. It, it frames the issue and it gives enough information for things to, to for you to contemplate. What if these things might be something important to look at? And then as we talk about it over time, she would ask me specific questions and then she would go read the documents. She'd come back and she'd go read documents and come back. And all of a sudden she came to me one day, it's about a year and a half in long conversations. And she said, I'm beginning to lean toward your argument. This is crazy. And then one thing happened to her. She <laughs> she was listening to her daughter read Jacob 2. Uh, okay. And then all of a sudden, 
it hit her in her chest. And she finally saw it differently. This came through Joseph Smith. And all of the things that we've been talking about that Joseph Sid said, did, preached, published, the people he excommunicated, the way he fought it, it finally all meshed together and she realized, I don't think he did it. That's usually the process that happens when people, they begin to really look at the individual pieces of this. And instead of just going the easy route, which is, come on, everybody knows, come on, you're you're telling me you're smarter than the historians no i'm not smarter than the historians his to we all have his, access to the same sources we, we, we can we're, we're all looking thing. at the same sources history is written from a perspective always and you've heard the phrase the the victors write the history and the historians in this regard have both had the same have both had agendas that have um parallel purposes on one hand the the fanny um von brodies of the world they want to destroy the character of joseph smith or you know tell the truth about him her book is easily debunkable but uh, from her perspective she wants to tell the truth about him and, and even and modern lds even brian hales and todd compton disagree with von Bro i mean ad- acknowledge that there are problems with von brody's book from my understanding and then, so and then many sorry. podcasters who 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 find themselves antag- antagonistic to joseph smith they no longer believe they they, they want to prove that joseph smith had an agenda and and was a you know was just a cat or you know he was just uh, girl hungry, power hungry, uh, a little crazy. So a any source genius. against him, they will jump on eagerly, and so, regardless and so their of how valid it is. purposes are to believe the stuff that says he was, and then those who are defending the traditional narrative want to uphold this narrative because of a continuity of a story from Joseph to today, and that there's no distinction between Joseph and Brigham. That's really important. There's no right. distinction between Joseph and Brigham. And, and our so, insistence on the idea that the Prophet can never lead us astray, which I think is unfortunate. I think when we can yeah. let that go, we can look at this more honestly and yeah. and with more confidence and not being afraid of what we might find. So continue, that's sorry. right. And so it's very it's very difficult um, when you're looking at that and 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 it seems like everybody's saying the same thing. So I acknowledge that that's the case with the exception of late, there is more and more and more material and more uh, cogent cases being made. To, to seriously consider our argument. And and, um, and I will say that that is because more documents are being available to us. We can right. actually look at the history. So we're not just relying on what people have said. That's so right. because that's what, so, so, so what, what you're saying, and I, I want to let you finish, but it's kind of like you need to, like, like we just had to spend all that time breaking down Leonard Sobey because that's one of the big <laughs> whatabouts, right? right, right. But, and so what it is, is there are always going to be whatabouts. And we can say right now, there are answers to every whatabout. There are. You might have to, you might have to be like, oh, come on, you know, but if you, because that's where you're starting. But if you consider the facts of, if you look at Joseph's and Hiram's words, throughout their lives, Emma's words, their letters to each other. You look at this, these love stories and these the character of these people. It's very easy to paint them through the lens of the Danites and the, you know of everything that was claimed about them, polygamy. But if you look at them honestly, look at the sacrifices they made, the, the tr- like, it's, like, like if you take a true p- portrait of them, it's hard to make polygamy work. It's hard to make it make sense. Yep. If you look at how I think a big one is Joseph always followed the revelations he did his best he believed them and he tried to obey them and they always are informed about the bible 132 is a huge departure from that you add to it that it wasn't added until 1876 it appeared out of nowhere in 1852 the only claim we had about it is from the very suspect william clayton in 1874 like all of these things and then you make the case of how many lies do we have to debunk? How many children do we have to prove aren't Joseph's that were claimed to be? How many, and we're going to go through some of the testimonies that women gave. How many do we have to show your dates are impossible? Your story is impossible. Right. You're right. And and then we find that gem that you <clears throat> just shared of Heber C. Kimball's journal to say there was funny business going on. There were <laughs> motives. And so the reason we, do, so I just want to point out, this is the story, actually, this whole big thing. And then we have to dive deeply into the few little pieces like Leonard Sobey. There are maybe 
maybe a dozen of those that are like yeah. con- considered contemporaneous evidence that can't just be part of the conspiracy. Yeah. And each one of those can be delved into for the people that want to. But what we need to say is the case is getting more and more clear as more and more historical documents yeah. are made available. 100%. Not the opposite. That's important. So I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to kind of sum up no, what, is, what is happening right now. That's very well said. That's very well said. And um, the, you'll hear people say, come on, Occam's razor says. Right, 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 right. The simplest right. answer is the right one. The more straightforward answer is the right one. And the most straightforward answer is he did it because all these people said, no, wait a minute. <laughs> Occam's razor says the simplest answer is the right one. The consistent evidence is far and away on Joseph's side. And I know people are chucking things at their computer right now. If you take time, you will see that I'm telling you the truth. From 1827 to 1844, the day he marries Emma to the day he's murdered, it is one long, exhausting string of outward acts Okay, that he does, that he speaks publicly, that he writes publicly, that he publishes in scriptures, over and over again throughout the scriptures, uh, that he is uh, uh, disciplining people, that he's exhorting people. It is continual. His very last public talk after his King Follett discourse where he says, you never knew me, you never knew my heart, no man knows my history. Think about that. At the end of his greatest sermon, he says, you never knew me. And then the next public sermon, May 26, 1844, he gets up in a long defense, speaking for, I think, an hour and a half. And he's talking about William Law. And he says, I keep, I keep careful records and, 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 and I can prove everybody perjurers. And, and it's, I've been scarcely preaching the gospel you know, uh, for, for five minutes when they said I have seven wives. This has been going on for 14 years now. How many times do I have to say this? I only have one pointing to Emma in the crowd, basically. And that's his final sermon. His final sermon before he's murdered. So it's not, it really, it's hard for me not to get a little bit frustrated when I hear carefully worded denials. His carefully worded denial. These are not careful. These are anything but. We We have Hiram just a month before on April 8th, 1844, he stands up after the King Follett discourse. We've talked about this a little bit. He, he preaches to, he, the, he called all of the elders home in a letter to talk specifically on this subject. This was approved by Joseph Smith, who was on the stand at the moment. Okay. Don't tell me that Joseph is, is burying his head in his hands and is, a, and is, well, is and embarrassed by his brother. I want to point out, this also is a few months after, supposedly, Hiram said to Joseph, only on the testimony of William Clayton, the doctrine is so pure and so so mm. beautiful that I know I can convince them if you'll write it. So uh, Hiram apparently said that in July. This is yeah. what? Is this September? This is April. Um, this is April 8th, 1844. The following. Yeah, just, just the follow- about um, from July to nine April. Nine months so later eight, or something. Eight months, nine yeah. months. So Hiram's and on so, the stand. And so I want to point out it's after this. The, and, and that story we have is only by William Clayton told in 1874. Yeah. So, okay. So, but this right. Hiram speech we have recorded right then. We have it recorded okay. on the day by Thomas Bullock. Okay. Mm-hmm. By the way, Thomas is the only one of the scribes to record this one. William Clayton, Willard Richards, Wilford Woodruff, who are the typical recorders, they don't record this talk. Okay. They also didn't add it to the history of the church well, where they and, added the other talks. And so they, you've talked about this a little bit. Brigham Young in 1845 starts officially, he says in his own records, I started revising the history of Joseph Smith. He meets in Willard Richard's office and he gathers his team around him and they're, and they're going through all the, all the records. We know with certainty that because we can see the transition from the what I'm going to call the earliest records, I don't believe they're the earliest records, but things like Joseph's supposed journal, that's the Willard Richards memo book where he's documenting on the days that jo- Joseph's doing this, that, or the other. Those, the public sermons, the other uh, other records, et cetera, they're co- coalescing it into a, a, a history that becomes B.H. Roberts' history of the church. Okay, the, It goes through several stages. Through the first stage, you have the copying over of stuff from the various sources into what's called um, the rough draft history. history. Okay, the rough, basically a rough draft. 
And in that rough draft, they copy Thomas Bullock's sermon uh, from Hiram on that day. That okay. copy has an X through it, marked out. Okay. Okay. And once you get to the dra- to the to the actual history, the manuscript history of the church, it's no longer there. Okay, so you then can see the, it being edited. Then okay. by the final the, by the final draft that's actually published, the sermon's there, but it's entirely changed, and there is no mention of anything to do with the main topic, which he talks from beginning to end on the subject of a man having more than one wife, which he says expressly. God has never commanded any man. Think about this. God has never commanded any man to have more than one. He's leaving no exception. When we say that 132 says God commanded Abraham specifically. So So we have to look at that huge contradiction. Right. So he is saying God has never commanded any man. By the way, at this point, we are acknowledging Hiram as a prophet, seer, and revelator. That's the Lord in 1841. He is the co-president of the church. He has been named by the Lord as the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay. That if you believe in, in, in Joseph Smith's Mormonism at all, that's important. Okay. Because early on in Hiram's ministry, the Lord told Hiram, don't go declare my word, obtain my word. That doesn't mean just read. That means get my word from me to you. I need to talk to you first. I need, like Jacob says, I need to, Jacob in the Book of Mormon, I need to give you your errand. Then will your tongue be unloosed, and then you'll have my spirit. Then you'll have power. Okay. It took a while. Hiram was a good student. Hiram was very faithful to his brother. And by 1841, he had received it. And Joseph acknowledged Hiram as such and made him co-president of the church. He's the second president of the church, not Brigham. Hiram is the second president oh, of the church. Oh, interesting. Oh, no, that's that's verifiable. We just don't acknowledge right. him that way. Okay. Yeah. And and the reason we don't acknowledge him that way is because Brigham disparages him later on. Okay. Mm-hmm. Brigham Brigham puts him down. And because and he Emma, wants and yeah. That's right. He wants to minimize Hiram's role. Well, Hiram stands up. This is in 1844. This stuff is coming to a fever pitch. Why? Because there's accusations by a guy named Bostwich, who has accused Hiram now of practicing polygamy, not just Joseph. And then and then, and then uh, William Law and Jane Law do the expositor. They re- release their affidavits with Austin Cowles. And, and it's coming to a fever pitch. Pre- previous to this, um, you read a little bit of this, The Voice of Innocence. Um, Emma has published that. Joseph began the uh, began authoring that with W. W. Phelps. Emma put the flourishing t- uh, finishing touches on it. Joseph has it read to a, a huge congregation. Emma reads it four times to the Relief Society. I mean, this is they are going all out, being extremely vocal. And by the way, this is after 1842 when they've been extremely vocal about against John Bennett. And okay? Can I just point out that if you're doing something, if you're doing something in secret. You wouldn't create this much confusion. No. You wouldn't. Let me back you know up. What I, mean? I could, I could see if up. he was making carefully worded denials, it wouldn't look like this. So in eight, no, people don't know this. In 1843, Joseph sued Chauncey Higby. We have the docket yes. on the Joseph Smith papers. We have all the court paper, all the court information. He took Chauncey Higby to court and sued him for slander and libel against him and Emma for saying that Joseph taught polygamy. Okay. Why in the world? Okay. So Joseph sued Chauncey Higby because he found out Chauncey Higby was saying this. Mm -hmm. And the challenge here is if you sue someone, like in um, Kennedy. You you expose yourself. You expose, like, like, like Kennedy, um, Robert Kennedy Jr., who just wrote Fau- the book on Fauci. Yes. He's very careful to say, look, I'm a lawyer. I, you, you're making yourself vulnerable if you either make false allegations That's or right. if you sue someone, then you could be count, you have to testify. So he, That's right. like, if, if, if he were really doing polygamy, he couldn't possibly sue. All Chauncey it would Higgins take is it. one disgruntled neighbor, uncle, sister. One of what the, how many? This? I think it's something like the dozen or so wives by that point that he supposedly has. You know, what and, year and is it that it happened? It's, this is in 1843. What, 
This is okay. Um, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I have it in my notes. I think it's. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I'll have to clarify that. I think it's 1843. He. It's either 1843, 1842. It's right before he goes into hiding because of it must be 1842 because Governor uh, Boggs in Missouri issues an extradition order and there are marshals in the town trying to arrest him. So he can't actually show up to court. The court case never goes forward because uh, okay. he has to go into hiding. But but the fact that he sued is just one more thing in a long line of things. Section 101, the section on marriage that 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 even though Oliver Cowdery wrote it, Joseph vouched for it and Joseph would later publish it again in the Times and Seasons. All of these things, it it, it is relentless, relentless. And it starts in 1835 when they acknowledge, hey, because we've been reproached for the crime of, uh, of polygamy and uh, and fornication, fornication and polygamy. Mm hmm. Wait, wait, wait. You're you're conflating polygamy and fornication and the voice of innocence complete conflates polygamy and adultery and, and prostitution. They, they always put them in the same bundle publicly. So it's awfully curious that if he's doing these, these are carefully worded denials and, and to his secret anointed quorum, he's going around, you know, secretly teaching this stuff. He's being awfully. You have to acknowledge how public he's being, how brave, how bold, how brazen he's being. And passionate. so he's pa you can hear the exhaustion uh, of these the exhaustion in that May 26th. It's, and, it's and, just like uh. and Hiram 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 speaks for an hour and a half back to that April 8th, 1844, hour and a half on the subject. And he says, I would rather be friends with the devil than somebody who teaches a pack of stuff like this. And he goes on and on and on and tells them, if you do this, you're losing your license. We're going to put you on trial. OK. And he's very, very clear. And he, he gives us a hint as to why the rumors are so rampant. He says, and you have to read this, it, it's written in, you know, note style. So, so there were abbreviated sentences. But Thomas Bullock records him saying, I went to Joseph because I had a question about my dead wife, Jerusha. You know, could... Because Joseph had taught him about sealing, this principle of sealing someone for eternity, sealing it up for, and sealing a man and a woman together for eternity. Okay. And so he asked Joseph about that. And Joseph said, you can be sealed to her. So he asked his current wife about that. And his current wife said, I will stand as proxy so you can be sealed to her. That's what the notes say. Later on, people interpreted that or they actually wrote it down. They put it in the manuscript history they, as one of the drafts. They tried to fix it. And it said, I will be sealed to both of them. It's not what the notes say. OK, OK. It just and said the notes are the only basis they have. For the we have. So it was another revision. OK, they tried to revise that to make it work. And that's the part they, they took out and they just couldn't put it at all in the, in the final draft. They just made the sermon into something much shorter. And Hiram gave some instructions on the priesthood or whatever. So, so they admit the in the final B.H. Roberts history of the church, it's this sermon is basically not there. But on the day, he says, Joseph basically allowed me to be sealed to my dead wife. And people are saying I'm practicing spiritual wifery because I'm sealed to my dead wife. And he says, no, 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 no. God has never commanded any man to have more than one wife ever. So you don't do it. And I don't want to hear this. He says, I hear if I heard it a thousand. So he's not even saying he's sealed to both wives. No. He's say, sealed to no. his first wife. That's it. So he's put in the same situation that widows are put in today. Basically, like, yes. I mean, I mean, it's kind of like, OK, he, he's not just sealing wives up to himself for the next life. Correct. He's not even like There's a not, widower today. There, There is not definitive indication that he's saying that he's sealed to both women. OK. And so. So so we have this stuff that's going on at the time, right? And 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 basically people aren't aware of the extent to which Joseph did these things. So to frame this issue, first of all, people have to be aware that historical consensus, believe it or not, is often dead wrong. So go do a Google search, just do an exercise, historical facts that have been proven wrong. Just do that. And you'll find actually a long list, and they'll, some of them will really surprise you. Things like George Washington didn't have wooden teeth, and Columbus didn't discover America, and and it goes, and 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 Thomas Edison did not discover the light bulb, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on and on. Okay, just go do that as an exercise. 
Well, I think it's also useful to think about the term the science is settled. Uh, like, yes. We need to be very wary of that term because I like, well, what that really is, is the same pride the Book of Mormon warns us about. Yeah. That's that's pride in saying, I already know everything I need to know. So I don't actually yes. need to apply the scientific method to these things Look, because I already know the answer. If, if they had if they had contemporaneous journal records from Joseph, if they had the journal that I just showed you with Heber Kimball on his mission, if if that was Joseph's journal and Joseph was in Kirtland having his hair combed by Eliza Snow and Eliza uh, combed my hair, washed his feet, feet, and then we went, went to, bed. to bed. What would they we would say, say that means? Your proof, but the problem is you don't have a single letter. You don't have a single contemporaneous journal entry, not from jo not just from Joseph, but from any of the women or any of the men. You don't have any. And we don't have a baby. And you have do no you know babies. What? So in the absence here's, of here's that the stuff, thing, knowing. Knowing the changes that were made, knowing the allegations, we haven't even, we're going to have to do this in two parts because this is already really long. We haven't even gotten into the Partridge sisters' testimonies, <laughs> which are pretty fun to get into. Yeah. Um, knowing all of the conspiracy that really was happening, all of the attempts and efforts to make Joseph guilty, including claiming that there were children, right? Mm -hmm. Including those claims. They did everything they could to create this picture, but they couldn't create a child because they didn't know there was going to be DNA testing. They couldn't create love letters. They couldn't create, well, they tried to create journal entries. Joseph went up and down the street preaching that there, no one should have mm -hmm. one but one wife, unless I command it, which was- Right, an, which they doctored They've made later. all of these yeah. changes. So they've doctored all of the history and I think that is important to recognize the more um, the more means we have of getting at the truth, such as DNA testing, such as the actual records being released, right? Mm -hmm. The more the lie is coming out, the more we are seeing. I mean, that's an important thing to recognize that the more and more we get, the more we can make the case of the lie. Absolutely. That, it should go the other direction. If Joseph is guilty, the more evidence we get that we should have these scandalous love letters and these, 100%. right? Like, so this is really an important thing to recognize. Right now, they're calling us crazy, but the tide is really going in our direction. Uh, and the I fact that the church isn't releasing more yes. kind of is is another testimony of yes. why aren't they? Why haven't they released more? Well, and that that's a that's a principle called adverse inference. Okay, it's a legal term that says if you make a claim of something and you say of evidence of it, but you won't produce the evidence, the jury can basically infer the opposite and the judge can even instruct them to say hey they, they're unwilling to prove this so you can basically infer the, that the opposite is true like the william clayton journals for example the william clayton journals are so suspect and you've gone over that so the, the this this issue if you understand several things uh, number one you have to understand the nature of the evidence we're dealing with things that have to do with memory you, you need to understand memory science memory science is well um, established. It, it, go look up studies of, of memories after 9-11. They've done studies on people after 9-11 right. who wrote down their memories and 10 years later they revisited them. The people recalling the events on the day, what they wrote down, they swore it didn't happen the way it wrote. They, they wrote it down. They swore it happens the way they remember it. Memory is extraordinarily suggestible and it's not an exact record. It's an interpretation of events. Uh, go listen to Malcolm Gladwell on the subject. He's got great podcasts on the science of memory uh, uh eyewitness testimony something to be understood there's a reason why people uh, there's a whole foundation devoted to getting people off of death row based on eyewitness testimony using dna science to disprove eyewitness testi testimony because eyewitness testimony is extraordinarily fallible and uh, uh along with eyewitness testimony then you need to understand the nature of, of how the books were cooked how how, Brig how extensively brigham young went to change the narrative of the history during Joseph Smith's lifetime. We don't have time to go into that today, but that is well established. The, the serious, credible historians acknowledge that Joseph did that. People like Richard Van Wagner- That Brigham did wrote, that. Ri that. What's that? That, that Brigham did that. That, that, sorry, that Brigham that, changed that, the Brigham history. That Brigham changed the history. So if you start there, 
the, to, 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 to understand the nature of the evidence that we're dealing with memories decades later and recollections and people claiming things and that there's absolutely no concrete evidence during Joseph's lifetime. I know they call things like Austin Cowell's concrete evidence. It's not. I just explained how Austin Cowell's could be talking about the very thing that Brigham Young's already doing, okay, that he claims he got in England. You, concrete you, evidence would be a child. Concrete evidence would be a, a letter. love letter from Joseph. Let's point out what it would be. Concrete Precisely. evidence would be the 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 actual trial of Emma divorcing Joseph or Emma claiming, you know, concrete evidence would be this was the house where the second sister Smith lived. That's there right. are lots of things that could be concrete evidence. Yep. And all of their claims about, well, it was secret, don't hold up because we have Heber C. Kimball's journals and we have the, do, do you know what I mean? And, and we have the, the, questionable journals that William Clayton was keeping that make all of yeah. these claims. There was plenty of, ev of opportunity to have any kind of concrete evidence, but all we have are complete denials that they have tried to re erase and minimize and alter and change. So, and we have revealed lie after lie yes, after lie. Yes. And so so I just wanted to point that, out what concrete evidence really should look like. Precisely. So we can compare it to a, a like nothing but a claim, a second or third hand claim. That's right. There's a reason there's a reason why we know Brigham did what he did because we have all that concrete evidence. We have it. We have the record yeah. uh, of his Brigham's, sermons. Pr Brigham's polygamy is not in question for no. good reason, no. right? Let's it's compare well what we have for Brigham's polygamy to Joseph's polygamy. They should look more similar. Exactly. So, given that Also, that is let me just point out one more thing. I'm really sorry, but also Brigham's polygamy was also illegal. It brought the US yeah. army against them. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. so just because they're in Utah doesn't mean oh, even yeah. even pre-1852, when they admitted polygamy, we can find a lot of concrete evidence of polyg Brigham's polygamy even before it was publicly attested, Absolutely. before they Absolutely. felt safe enough. So I just want to make those distinctions of what we yeah, should we, be looking for. What we, it we know, for example, like. that his second wife, Augusta Cobb, sues him in court in 1847. Sorry, her husband, Henry Cobb. <laughs> this is funny. She, she was married to Henry Cobb. Uh, Brigham Young married her while she's married to Henry Cobb. And in 1847, he's so upset, Henry is, that he takes Augusta to court and sues for divorce on the grounds of adultery. Henry wins. So at least by a legal standard, Brigham Young is legally acknowledged to be an adulterer in 1847. Okay, so... We know all this stuff because we know what Brigham Young was doing. Plus, we have the sealing records from 1845, 1844, 1845, they after Joseph is dead. So if there's no sex, and by the way, and, and if we get to it now or in another time, I will show you that what Brian Hale says is the strong evidence of sexual relations is not just not strong, it's a lie. Okay. Strong evidence would be a child. Well, I guess that would be <laughs> that would be certain evidence, right. right? Right. And then there there could be lots of different things that would be strong evidence. Yes. What he calls strong evidence is extremely weak. It's in extremely my opinion. weak. Only one woman ever said, only one in 1892. How many years later is that? In 1892, an old woman named Emily Partridge under cross-examination, when finally asked something she, I don't think she ever thought she would ever be asked. Did you have sexual intercourse with him? The second piece is, if Section 132 has no actual verifiable connection to Joseph Smith, then you cannot claim that he had a re revelation other than what other people said. And can you trust what they said? And then the third piece is, what did Joseph actually teach on ceilings? What do we know and what do we not know? And let's be really honest and clear about that. Then the fourth piece is to understand what Joseph actually did during his lifetime. When you see that picture, when you see everything from 1827 to 1844, and you include in that things like when Don Carlos dies, and he's supposedly taking a wife just in a few more days, and, and he's being so callous toward Emma, in the way that he's just willy-nilly taking all these new wives and bedding them, as Todd Compton would say. And Emma is in the depths of despair. When you see everything put together and all the discourses that he's, that he's teaching, these profound prophetic discourses and all of the court cases he's dealing with and all of the excommunications he's dealing with, when you see it all in context, a different picture emerges. And you have to say... Where does all this fit? And then when you take a look at the fifth piece, 
the Brighamite culture in their theology is the belief that there is no sin. They're automatic. They've commit, got to go to heaven free card. That will that will okay. that will take me away from 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 the highest degree of celestial glory because I've entered in to the to the what they call the holy order. Okay. Okay. Which is which is which is a a twist on what the scriptures call the holy order. The holy order is very different in the scriptures than what they're doing. They think the holy order is one man and at least three women, but hopefully 50, you know, and in eternity, a thousand or whatever, because I have a big train that fills the temple and my trains, my wives, you know, that's the uh, that that's the notion. And the second anointing was where they were promised these things. Catherine Lewis doesn't go through that part. OK, but but what she what she learns is that they're that they say, I'll tell you these things. But if you tell anybody, I'll tell them you're lying. I'll put the lie on you. OK, so this is the pattern we learn. So we learn that there's this this is secrecy, this this threat of lying. And she also says, when I didn't accept plural marriage, I was afraid for my life and had to flee the city because I thought I was in danger. This was a common theme as well. So we have to understand not only do they believe themselves gods and goddesses, kings and queens on the earth, that is not to be taken lightly. Brigham Young acted like it. OK, he acted like it. At least during the Mormon Reformation period, he got a little humble. You mean he acted like he was a god? Is that what you're saying? He uh -huh. acted like he was a god on the earth. Heber, okay. Heber, Heber called Brigham. He said, "Brigham, it, Joseph was Brigham's god, and Brigham is my god." That's what Heber said about Brigham Young. Think about that. Well, that's what Heber was saying when they were crossing the plains in that Law of Adoption sermon as well. He yes, was like I'm a god to you, and yes, that's that's mm -hmm. how they twisted Joseph's teachings, in my view. I don't believe Joseph was teaching that kind of hierarchical godhood nonsense at all, but that's what they believed, and that's verifiable in their teachings. You know, this thing that Brian Hale says that they they never taught that that it was required for the highest degree of the no. celestial kingdom is is patently false. It's just false. It is, yeah. And and for fair Mormon and for for Brian to say that you say that without in in the face of undeniable statements. Okay, it By might Brigham be the himself. same. It might be the same ideology of defending the kingdom is the highest good like i can you know maybe they're kind of working yes. in that same model and so that brings us to the to the next this has been written written about ad nauseum lying for the lord this principle mm -hmm. it's it's not a, not only accepted it's just no big deal why because we are defending the kingdom and so it's prudent like john taylor is in is in uh, france in 1850 He's standing on the debate stage with another man, and they're talking about the principles of the gospel. And this other man accuses him publicly, openly, think about this, of abominations and polygamy. And he says, how dare, he wags his finger, how dare you, sir? Okay, so we, repeat, so this is John Taylor. What year is this? And this 18, is in England. Did you... eight, no, France in 1850. Oh, in France. Okay, so France in 1850, so two years before they've admitted it, but verifiably after they were absolutely yeah. doing it. And this isn't yeah. like the Joseph Smith, they were doing it. Like, we and know they says, have children. He says, how dare you? We only practice what our scriptures say. Section, And then he reads from section 101. This is publicly in France, okay? John Taylor is getting up, and and at the time, he had something on the order of 16 wives. Okay, that we was, know this isn't based on later testimony. John yeah. Taylor had the sealing records yeah. of 16 wives. I'm just know, I just want to draw the difference between yeah. John Taylor and Joseph Smith. We know he had multiple wives and was having children with multiple wives. Mm -hmm. And later, I believe it's a And when he's when he's accused on a foreign mission when he's told you're doing polygamy, he says, "How dare you? Basically, we only yes. do." And he opens his scriptures and reads from section 101 now, that I'm, had I'm it yet been removed. That. I don't know if he opened his scriptures, right. but he quotes from it. Okay, so you get the point. Okay. Oh, later okay. Okay. Later he's confronted by E.C. Briggs, I believe, who's an apostle in the RLDS church, and he's saying, "Why did you lie back then in France?" And John Taylor says, "Well, it was prudent. They wouldn't have let me stay." So he's, he tells E.C. Briggs it was prudent, it was meaning prudent it was what was mm -hmm. necessary. Yeah, it was okay. prudent to lie. So, and, and, and many authors have written on the subject this, this lying for the Lord, which, by the way, starts with Samson Avard, who, who's the first one that we know of, to put the notion out there that it's, it's righteous to lie for the Lord. And, and let me point out also that, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm pointing out that in some of the denials that were like printed in the newspaper or the letter that was sent to the Relief Society that was so strongly worded, Brigham Young's signature is right there 
uh, you know, oh, and yeah. Heber C. Kimball's. Yeah, right. So we have them on record yes. lying. Denying. We have them on record lying. Denying that, that there is no other system but but of marriage save 101 and they print 101. Uh, section 101, the law on marriage that, that says uh, that there's no polygamy, fornication, one and man, so, one wife. And so, yeah. Right. So when and William so, Mark says that Joseph Smith said, I was deceived, it doesn't mean deceived about polygamy. It means no. about the people I trusted. I was okay, deceived by, by, if you couple William Mark's I was deceived statement, in their character. If you, dece- if you couple William Mark's statement with William Smith's statement, the brother of Joseph Smith, William, William Mark says, Joseph came to me a couple of weeks before he died and said, I have been deceived. Um, and he repented of what he had done. And he said, uh, put all these men up on charges who are who are teaching mm-hmm. this polygamy system. Well, if he was doing it, he would have been telling him to put himself up on he charges. He also had already excommunicated people. So he of couldn't course. be telling William Marks, I just re- realized right. this. And now we need to start excommunicating and, people. William Marks misunderstood. And William Smith. William Smith says, I was at dinner with your with, with, talking to Joseph Smith the third. I was at dinner. Um, just a couple weeks or a few days before your dad was killed. And Emma at the table said, John Taylor, Willie Richards, and um, Heber Kimball or Brigham Young, one of the three, uh, are going around teaching stuff that's going to ruin the church. And and William said she was talking about polygamy, basically. And, and Joseph says, ah, as soon as I get done with the laws and the fosters, the expositor thing, I'll deal with them. And then he says, and, and, and your father said, I think I'm going to have a s- trouble, especially with Brigham Young. Okay. OK, and so so if William Marks is telling the truth and if William Smith is telling the truth just a little before they died and put in context, the voice of innocence in January of 1844, Hiram Smith's talk in August 8th, 1844 and May 6, 20, May 26, April. 1844, no, April 8th, 1844, Hiram and then Joseph getting up on May 26, 1844, saying, I don't do this right in that time frame. William Marks is is giving getting instructions from Joseph to go put these men on trial and investigate Brigham Young and John Taylor and all the rest. And, oh, does he and, name them? Okay. Well, I know no, he says not, the twelve. Hold on, not. But he names putting, the twelve. I'm putting them together. So William William okay. Marks doesn't name them. William Smith names them. And, okay. And William okay. Smith says he didn't get to do it because he was killed. Does that make okay. sense? So yeah. So so I'm tying pieces together that are that are after the. Uh, stories told after the events, just like they do with the other stories. But I'm acknowledging these are after the event, so you have to judge them for their for their provenance, for their proximity, and 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 for their veracity. But you have to acknowledge that they exist. There's a totally right. different narrative out there that is, in my mind, just as credible. At least we should consider it. So. Brighamites. Well, it also goes along with the things Joseph was saying and the no children, the no known wives. Yes. I, I want to say, if Joseph were trying to teach this tricky of a doctrine, look at how many sermons throughout the Journal of Discourses, how often they had to preach it and repeat it and say it and warn. And like, like Joseph couldn't have taught this extreme of a doctrine while speaking out of both sides of his mouth and no, only on the like he couldn't it wouldn't have worked let me let me let me illustrate the point so the story that william clayton says is that hiram's trying to convince emma you know that 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 polygamy is a a, a, a good and pure doctrine because it's this glorious pr- principle if you just write it down joseph i can convince any man that it's that it's that it's a wonderful thing so just get, give it to me so i can give it to emma and he goes well i'm you know can you get the urim and thummim and joseph goes ah, i got it memorized Okay, which is odd because then he puts a whole bunch of stuff about Emma that wouldn't have I been just in there covered in 1831. That. So, yep. so it's a strange story altogether. However, one thing that William Clayton doesn't remember in 1874 is that Emily Partridge claims that in May of 1843, a couple months before, okay, that Emma already participated yeah. in a marriage right. with her and her sister. Okay, and that she participated again with Maria and Sarah Lawrence. So Emma was had already given Joseph four wives. So why in the world would would Emma need to be convinced that it was a true principle, even if she didn't? Because she went back on it. She participated in the wedding, but changed her mind by that night. She went back on it only with the Partridge sisters, and then she married two more to him. So no matter how you look at it. 
even if she was and she wouldn't have married the partridges if she hadn't heard the revelation and been convinced right i'm just known it and accepted it because as emily says emma taught us the principles Okay. Right. And so, I want to point out that Brian Hale's explanation is for that is that Emma was the point where she needed strong language. She needed threats of destruction. She needed. And I that makes me so angry. So, frankly, it's just that's historical malpractice. That's irresponsible. And that is nowhere, nowhere in the contemporaneous record. And, and, and it's and worse that than that. It's claiming it's claiming that that's who God is. It's worse than it's worse than even I mean, historical malpractice is bad, but it is. I mean, we talk about evil speaking of the Lord's anointed. This is evil speaking of God. This is taking the Lord's name in vain in the worst 100%. way to say that that like like I did my episode on Emma. If people haven't watched it, I hope they will, because yeah. to claim that God is this this character is just it destroys faith, as we've seen. So continue. Yep. Sometime we should break down 132 and do an I, exhaustive yes, on 132 mm -hmm. because that when you when you break that down, you understand it's very possible that they, as James Whitehead said, he said he saw that there was part of it, that there was a revelation. It was two pages, not eight, two pages, much shorter. And it had to do with sealing, but it had nothing to do with polygamy. It's very possible that those short verses on one man, one wife, maybe are the revelation that Joseph received on sealing. It's been so corrupted, it's impossible. It, this is what James Whitehead said. He right, said, right, right, he right. Was asked, he was asked, did you see it? He said, I did see the, the, the one Brigham produced. He said, and it had some similarities, but it had been so twisted as to sanction polygamy when before it had nothing to do with polygamy. And he said, and mm -hmm. he was pressed, the, the lawyer tries to trip him up. He says, he says, how could you possibly remember that long ago? He goes, I would remember something about that principle that clearly. And if you told me 40 years from hence, I would remember if they took polygamy now and they took it out. That's something that stark. It had nothing to do with polygamy back then. And it does now. It's been totally altered. And he, and his, just go read his testimony if you haven't, uh, read it or heard it, it's very compelling what he says. And if this is the guy that was over Joseph's journals and over his private letters, and he saw him every day, and he visited with him once a week at his home, and he saw Emma often, never saw him with a wife during this whole time when he's supposedly doing it, and knew about sealings, had had his own dead wife sealed to him, it's a testimony worth considering. Notice Brian Hales, Todd Compton, never right. mentioned They him. ignore it. They, they completely ignore it. Ignore it. And, and, and by dishonest. the way, there are a hundred testimonies like that. Okay. And so, so to, so to say, I just can't believe these people would lie. You need to understand what, what the Brighamites actually did, the nature of their practice of polygamy, which by the way, went far beyond the bounds of section 132. And that list of long things that, that, that goes from, from sex and section 132 and ceilings and what Joseph did and what Brigham did, understanding by the way, that this was tried in, in two courts of law in Kirtland and in the Temple Lot case in which the LDS church lost the narrative, by the way, the judge decided against the narrative that Joseph was a polygamist, that he was the founder of polygamy. Okay. After hearing all the all the testimonies, that's not told to right. me normally. Okay. Judge Phillips, his decision, he but he did not believe the women, especially. They weren't okay? credible, right. They were not mm -hmm. credible to him. In the Kirtland case, the same thing. And then the final piece, which you have done, is understanding the scriptural piece. And when you when you put all of that together, I believe Occam's Razor says. Yeah. The simplest explanation is he wasn't doing it. And we ought to look at the Book of Mormon and Joseph in a different way. We ought to, we ought to, we ought to ask the church to do what they've done with blood atonement, what they've done with the race issue and Brigham Young, what they've done with the Adam God theory, um, what they've done with 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 him commingling church and family. state and and all of these things that he did that were more like King Noah in the Book of Mormon than they were like Joseph Smith or King Benjamin. And so they have tried to distance themselves from Brigham Young in so many ways. They can do it here. And they could at very least, if they if they want to just not be, you know, too um, too much like us, they could at least say it's really unclear what Joseph's involvement was, if anything. And therefore... We know what Brigham did. We believe polygamy to be an abomination, like the scriptures say. And as far as Joseph is concerned, we don't, we cannot say with certainty that he did.
if they would at least do that, that would be something. We'll see. But yeah, I think we can look at That's... Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon with different eyes if we pull this. Well, and I also want to propose something. Okay, I, I want to propose something to, because right now who we really are stepping on their toes, I think, you know, are people who have have decided Joseph was this bad guy and yeah. they now oppose him and oppose the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's really an emotional reaction on that side too, to this claim that, you know, so I, know. I would invite people or maybe challenge people, dare people to say, let the emotion aside to look. And if you, if you still like, if the polygamy issue was taken out of it, maybe you still have other concerns, book of Abraham, you know, whatever it is, but the polygamy is the big one. If you take it out of it, then you can do a more fair reasoned assessment of the value of the Book of Mormon, the value of these things. Maybe they still don't have value in your life. That's fine. But why are you reacting so emotionally? Yeah. And are you willing to remove the emotion? And and many people now have gone to rationality yes. rather than religion and experience. Right. And so That's I guess right. I would invite and challenge people to look at it rationally. Consider if you take Joseph out, uh, the polygamy out of Joseph, what does that mean for you? Why are you reacting so strongly? Uh, it's a fair I question. I think it's a great question. And I think there's two groups of people for whom this argument is really relevant. There are people inside the LDS church and even, even some, and I've met them, who are FLDS or parts of certain polygamous sects. I have met people who have been one one member of a, of a polygamous family who read my talk and listened to my my talk and and my the paper that I that I wrote, and he said that completely turned me around. I was I thought wow that's that's interesting. And he 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 began from that point forward to have a, a change of view. People in in these groups, um, mostly Brighamite churches okay but the lds church in particular who are troubled by this they don't want to abandon their roots they don't want to abandon the book of mormon but they don't know how to deal with the contradictions and 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 this one opens them up to oh the book of mormon translation stuff and all the accounts of the first vision and now book of abraham which by the way suffers from the same problem as the polygamy issue it's stories from other people and how do you deal with those and and i can tell you that there are Occam's razor and rational ways to look at those complaints and problems and to understand them and in in a way that helps and for you. all of the people right now that are saying oh come on no. you just need to like it's like no take that emotion out of it look mm -hmm. at it rationally so uh, so consider. so I'm talking to the people in the church at first who are struggling with it to hold on because they're about to lose it start with polygamy do a deep dive. Don't trust me at all. What I've what I've said today, this is probably sounding overwhelming. It's a long conversation. There's so much to go through. And my work over the next year to two years is to unpack all of this in a, in a methodical way so that people can see it all and then and see all the sources, read the sources for themselves. And I'm doing a I'm doing a project on that, which maybe sometime some other time we'll talk about. But you can see it all, you can assess it all, and then make your own determination. But don't trust me and don't trust Brian Hales. Look at the sources and then look at the Absolutely. scriptures and ask your father in heaven for the people who are who have left the church. I totally I made a statement in my talk. It is far more intellectually consistent and spiritually consistent to leave this all together. If you believe that Joseph Smith did those things, I totally agree with that because then he's a liar and he's a manipulator. He's a deceiver and he and he is he is vile. If the things that are said of him, he's a psychopath. True, when you consider what Emma was going through in her life, one hundred percent, and what he was doing, and so mm -hmm. I understand, I understand and sympathize and empathize with the emotionality that comes into this when talking about he didn't do those things. I get the reaction, but I would ask, I'm not going to reach all all of the people who feel that way. There's just no way because people have made up their minds in both camps. But there is a group of people, and I know this because. In the, in the time I spent in the single world, uh, going to dances and talking to guys and girls and going on dates with people, I would, I would always, we'd, religion would come up. And most of the people I met were either on the verge of or had left the church. And they were, they, they were losing their faith or had lost their faith altogether. But I met a number of people for whom they still had a lot of affection for their upbringing 
for moments with a baby, for moments in prayer, for moments with the scriptures, for a time on a mission, for things I can't reconcile. Why? How did this? How did I feel this way? And and the rationality of the other side says, ah, it's just the it's just the endorphins in your brain. It's just the synapses. It's just it's just your body. Ah, it's just... There are those of you listening to this who know that's not true. Even if you don't know what God is right now, I understand that. I understand what it feels like to be without God in the world. And I also understand what it feels like to rediscover a relationship with God. And I also understand what it means to look at the restoration from a new lens. That lens being Joseph told the truth. If he told the truth, if he had no reason to lie, the man died in bankruptcy court and with one wife. Who and... inherited all of his debts that was left. <laughs> anyway, continue. What motivation did he have other than the cause of truth, which he constantly put forward? So those of you who have affection in your heart in some place, even though you've given up on it to a degree, just maybe investigate this about polygamy. If you can find what I found, what Michelle is finding, that he was innocent of these things and that this was at the feet of Brigham Young and others, then perhaps uh, it's not my encouragement for, encouragement for people to leave the church or come back to the church. That's that's between you and, and God. But perhaps you can hold on to something in the Book of Mormon. Perhaps you can hold on to the kernels of the restoration that are so beautiful. Because I believe... Which is the cornerstone of our religion. The yes. Book of Mormon is the value. It is the thing yes. that we can't explain away, no matter how hard we try. We haven't done it yet very well. And, yeah. and it is what teaches the connection to God. And it is yeah. the first thing that Joseph was. Anyway, continue, like, like that, that is worth reinvestigating. You I don't have to buy all the, you know, people don't have to buy into all of the Brigham history and all of the Mormon culture and all of the current affairs, all of that. It's worth reconsidering if there we might can be something we can of value of all in that. the Book of Mormon. We can repent yeah. of all that, which just means changing our mind. We're human. We're mortal. Like, right, right, right. We can okay. have, repentance, all it means is to change your mind or to turn and face God. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to right. face any institution as our, as our, as our lodestar. We don't have we to can, face any We can, but we person. don't have to. We can face right. God and we can, we can believe. We can exercise a belief. I started with just a mere belief and I still hold on to belief. I don't have a lot of conviction and knowledge and, and firm testimony, which a lot of my Mormon friends think is crazy because we're told we have to have this certainty. I don't have a lot of certainty. I no, I, I said I hold things much more lightly now. There yes. are some things that are completely core, but some that I'm like, I I like how that feels. I have a testimony yes. of it, I, but, I I, but I'm Jesus much says. lighter than I was. I love what Jesus says. Blessed are they who believe who have not seen. And I think there's something very beautiful in belief. And you can, if you have, if you've, if you've gone through this period of not believing, you can find that again. I'm living right. proof of that. And you can find it by seeing the restoration through new eyes. So that's my invitation yeah. today. That's beautiful. You can let go of the claims about Joseph and consider reestablishing a connection to God. That's not a bad trade. It's not a bad trade. <laughs> I think it's pretty good. And by the way, if you're still super angry, keep listening because you never know. You yeah, know, you, you yeah. Might, there's a lot more point, to dig into. At one point, that anger might switch to a just like with my wife. Wait, what? Wait. I think yeah. I might be leaning toward just keep listening. Right. More to come. More to come. Always. Jeremy, this has been amazing. Long in depth. So <laughs> great. I'm sure we will talk again. So okay. it's been a pleasure. Thank this. you. Um, I, I have so much respect for the work you're doing. I hope you keep it up. Um, I hope you weather the, the mockery and, and the insults. And, and that's OK. You know what? What did Christ say? You know what? Apostles? Joseph did it. Jesus did it. I'm small potatoes no compared. Big deal. So no big deal. I'm, we just keep getting a thicker and thicker skin. They haven't tarred and feathered me yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Thanks, thank Michelle. you so much. Have a great night. And you I'm too. sure we will talk again. Bye -bye. All right. Goodbye.
I hope you enjoyed that discussion. Some of the things that I cut out were some of the best parts because we got into talking about the affidavits and the validity of the affidavits. The, uh, that's where we get all of our evidence for Joseph being a polygamist is from all of the affidavits that happened later on. So I cut those, that part of the discussion out because I want to have Jeremy to come back on and we will just address the affidavits. And so we're going to do that as a future ep episode. Look forward to it. But um, I hope to see you next time and thank you for sticking with me.